Our first presenter is George Chizios. He's in cell molecular and cell structural biology. His advisor is uh, Dr. Katia Del Rio Sonas, and he's going to talk about towards the induction of lens regeneration, lessons learned from the new. Okay. Improving the quality of life after losing a body part uh, with the use of prosthetic, artificial prosthetic has been long term for the medical field. But what if there was an even better way to do this to replace damaged body parts, not with the use of steel and carbon fibers, but with the use of our own flesh and blood. Even though today regeneration is often associated with science fiction, there are many animals that can regenerate different body parts naturally. The best vertebrate known so far is the newt, that you can see up there. I'm interested in knowing why these animals have such a tremendous capability to regenerate their lips, their tail with spinal cord, their brain, their heart, and, and eye parts to a degree that we humans cannot. The focus of my research is in the eye, and more specifically the lens. Even while in humans, injury of the lens is permanent and it will result in uh, impairment of vision or even complete loss of vision, the damaged lens in nudes can completely get replaced and then they restore their vision. How do they do that? Well, after the lens is removed, the, the cells from the top iris, which is called the dorsal iris, and, uh, and respond to injury by reprogramming into, and then eventually become the lens. These top dorsal cells undergo a series of transformation with time uh, and they change, they change sense shape and gene expression and so they change their identity which means they are not anymore iris cells and they can become different kind of cells which eventually they become less cells. Uh, at day 90 uh, a new lens is formed, which is an exact replica of the intact lens. What's fascinating about this process is that the bottom part of the iris, the ventral iris, never participate to the process of regeneration. In fact, it was known, the, it was first discovered, this was first discovered in 1891, and the question still remains unanswered. Why the dorsal and never the ventral iris undergo differences to regenerate? Through the use of newly available technology, we recently identify the difference between dorsal and ventral iris at the molecular level. So what I'm trying to do is use this information and try to manipulate the ventral iris to become a lens. In other words, I'm trying to introduce the dorsal identity into the ventral iris and hopefully induce regeneration. I strongly believe that if we're able to induce ventral regeneration and understand the mechanism behind this, we, it will lead to breakthroughs in the field of regeneration, and then one day we can investigate the possibility of using this information into animals that can regenerate, such as humans. Thank you. <laughs> Finalist number two is Giyoti Kasia from the Department of Microbiology, her advisor is Professor DJ Ferguson, and the title of her presentation is Presence of Quaternary Amines in Diet and its Associated Cardiovascular Risks. Good afternoon. So um, there's this interesting statistic which says that 58% of the meat consumers in the United States prefer red meat as compared to any other kind of meat. But why am I interested in red meat? Number one, hamburgers and steaks are delicious. Number two, <laughs> Quaternary, it consists of the compound called as quaternary amines. And quaternary amine is a compound that is present in highest concentrations in red meat, approximately 100 to 150 milligrams per four ounces. So we also obtain this from other food sources in our diet, like milk or dairy-based products, like eggs, milk and cheese, and some other seafoods, like fish. But uh, imagine yourself right now eating a delicious hamburger, and what is the fate of that hamburger once it gets into your digestive system? It's going to go into your stomach, it's going to get acted upon by stomach acids, following which it goes into your intestines, which is the spot for absorption of all the goodies that your food has. So the human gut harbors trillions of bacteria sitting inside there, 
just helping us digest our food. So as a result, some of those bacteria end up converting these quaternary amines into a compound called as TNA. And once a lot of DNA gets absorbed into your blood vessels, it ends up forming clots. And once clots are formed, your poor heart has to work really hard to pump blood into our body. So as a result, we, it leads to heart diseases, which is never good. So my research is aimed at looking at the bacteria that reside in the gut of healthy individuals, and specifically those that can either eat up the DNA or they can convert the quaternary amine into another compound which is less harmful or not harmful at all. And we have evidence for that in our lab recently as well. So in order, of, by doing this, if I'm successful in isolating some potential candidates or these bacteria, I can use them as probiotic. We can use them to manipulate the populations of bacteria residing in our gut so that we have the good ones or the bad ones in people suffering from these diseases. And also the most recent one, the fecal transplant, which is a very recent therapeutic remedy. So in the end, I would like to conclude by saying that if a little bit is good, then it doesn't necessarily mean that a lot will be better. <laughs> Thank you. Finalist number three, Shannon Speed from the Department of Kinesiology and Health, and her advisor is Professor Rosemary Ward, and she will be talking about drunkorexia behaviors and mindfulness among college students. Shannon. Humor me for a moment and close your eyes. Place your hands in your lap. Feel the weight of your body in your chair and the feeling of stillness around you. Take a deep breath in, filling your lungs and opening your rib cage. Exhale slowly and completely. As you breathe, relax the muscles in your face, down through your neck and shoulders. Feel the calmness run through your arms, down your spine, and into your legs. Return to that breathing. Notice how it feels as it goes in through your nose, down through your throat, and into your lungs. Now open your eyes. Annually, it is estimated that 599,000 college students suffer alcohol-related injuries each year. Another 696,000 students are victims of assault by another student under the influence of alcohol, and 97,000 students are victims of alcohol-related rape and sexual assault. In addition, 1,825 students die from alcohol-related unintentional injuries. In conjunction, college students also share a prevalence of eating disorders on campuses, ranging from 8 to 17% of a student population. Now imagine pairing the effects of eating disorders and alcohol consumption. Drugorexia, the restriction of food prior to con consumption of alcohol in order to limit calorie intake, is where eating disorders and poor alcohol habits collide. In fact, it's reported that 14 to 46 percent of college students actually participate in drunkorexia behaviors. Now, the exercise I had you perform at the beginning is a form of mindfulness therapy. Mindfulness begins with bringing awareness to a current moment in time when one is better able to regulate thoughts, feelings, and sensations from moment to moment. Mindfulness is utilized in order to help treat things such as addiction, anxiety, and depression disorders. Now, my research focuses on the five facets of mindfulness, acting with awareness, describing, non-judging, non-reacting, and observational skills, and their direct or indirect relationship to drunkorexia behaviors and motive, alcohol consumption, and eating disorders. As a pioneer in this realm of study, my hope is to provide evidence and support of intervention-based programming that incorporates mindfulness therapeutic techniques in an effort to deter hundreds of thousands of preventable alcohol-related assaults and deaths of college students each year. Thank you. Finalist number four, Ms. Khan Koseler, 
in the Department of Computer Science. His advisor is uh, Professor Matthew Steffen, and the title of his presentation is Model Driven Engineering for Big Data Analytics. All right, thanks everybody for coming today. So I think we've all had that experience of shopping on Facebook or on Amazon and seeing some ad pop up. And it's something that you weren't necessarily thinking of buying, but um, you know, it's kind of weird that it just shows up there. You yeah, have been talking about it, you yeah, have been posting about it, and a lot of people think, well, are they listening in on my phone calls or something like that? And it's not really the case. What's happening is that they've built this really high quality machine learning software that analyzes your past behavior and the past behavior of people like you to predict what kinds of products you're gonna buy in the future. So it's not easy to build something like this. You need computer science knowledge, you need machine learning knowledge, and you need knowledge about the domain that you're working in in order to build these kinds of applications. So I kind of wanted, in my work, to bridge the gap between people who have domain-specific knowledge, but not necessarily the knowledge required to actually build these applications with computer science and machine learning, things like that. So one thing that I think holds promise is called model-driven engineering. And basically the idea behind model-driven engineering is that you can build software without having to write a single line of code just by building a model that kind of shows you what the program's behavior is supposed to be. And these models are actually pretty simple. They can just look like rectangles connected by arrows together. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. You can make it in Microsoft Paint. So to give you an example of what something like this, like, might, like this might look like, uh, suppose you're working in Miami's admissions office and you want to predict the number of students that are going to accept the offer that you've extended to them. Uh, that's a big problem, right? You don't want every student that you've extended an offer to to actually accept and attend the university because we don't have room for all those people, right? We don't want to spend the money that's gonna be required to house them all off campus. So maybe you can build a program just by building a model of the variables that we know are relevant, because we're a domain expert in admissions if we're working there. We know that if the student's out of state, that's gonna be a big factor if they're in state, so we can call that one variable in state or out of state. Another variable can be how much financial aid do we actually give the student. And then we'll have the predictive variable, which is gonna be do they actually accept our offer. And so my work is actually building a code generation engine that'll take in a model like that and output software without you having to write a single line. So in the example of the admissions office, maybe you don't have the resources required to contract that out to some organization building software for you, and maybe you don't have the expertise in computer science and machine learning to build it yourself. So you can just build the model where you say, I know that in-state and out-of-state is a big factor. I know that the amount of financial aid that I'm gonna give the student is also a big factor. And then I'm gonna use those two, connect them with errors, and say, this is gonna predict whether or not the student actually accepts our offer. You didn't have to write a single line of code. You didn't even have to know what's, what's going on. My code generation engine took the model that you built, outputted software for you, and outputted predictions based on the data that you already had of past cohorts, being that you worked in the admissions office. And so I'm hoping that this is gonna kind of bridge the gap between computer science expertise and domain-specific knowledge. Thank you. So, finalist number five, I get to introduce her before she gets to start talking, is Valerine Rajathi. She's in the Cell Molecular and Structural Biology program, and her advisor is Dr. Professor Lori Isaacson, and she will be talking about guardians of the spinal cord, understanding neuroprotection. I have always wanted to be a superhero. But you know, I'm in science and all we get to be are mad scientists. <laughs> but then I heard about problems like Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's, diseases that caused impaired movement of the body due to damaged nerve cells. And I thought to myself, what we absolutely needed was lab coat wearing, microscope wielding, superheroes on the job, which is why I chose to study the spinal cord. <laughs> Nerve cells, or neurons, are the messengers of the nervous system, relaying information to and from the brain and the spinal cord. And because these neurons are obviously so important, they have cells that take care of them, called the glial cells. The word glia is derived from the Greek word for glue, which is very appropriate because the glial cells are literally the glue holding the nervous system together. Now there are many different kinds of glial cells, each of them having their own diverse function, including forming important components of the neurons. Now, 
In the case of an external injury to the nerves, there is an immediate effect within the spinal cord where these glial cells are the first to react and arrive on site, much like first responders. Once they centralize around the site affected by an injury, they get activated and they divide and multiply in large numbers, an indicator for unusual activity. However, different glial cells divide and get activated at different time points based on their function. I am currently doing a time course study in which I hope to assess on rat spinal cords, half of which have an external injury and the other half that don't. By using various cellular and molecular techniques, I hope to establish exactly what kind of glial cell is activated first at a three-day time point, <coughs> then at a seven-day time point. To study this effect, I injected my rats every day for three days or seven days with a chemical called BIBU that binds to dividing cells and therefore helps me visualize them using microscopy and imaging techniques. You may ask, why am I so interested in knowing the exact time point of activation? Well, we believe that by knowing exactly what kind of glial cell is active at what time point, we can develop a therapy that is specifically targeted towards that kind of glial cell. And I hope that by studying the behavior of these guardians of the nervous system, our glial cells, we will gain better insight into developing, if not a cure, at least a therapy that slows down the progression of the disease. Because when the villain at hand is a neurological injury, it's the glial cells to the rescue. <laughs>
came to generate new retina. It is a very big deal for therapy to treat patients with vision loss. Thank you. Finalist number nine, oh, number eight, sorry. Finalist number eight, Isha Kalra, Department of Microbiology. Her advisor is Professor Rachel Morgan Tisch. And she'll be talking about tackling climate change with Antarctic algae, unique adaptations under extreme environment. Climate change. It's not a phenomenon of the future, it's a Antioxidants are able to neutralize oxygen 
and together they create somewhat of a balancing act in our bodies. Some cells, such as the stem cell, may need less oxygen and more antioxidant, whereas other cells, such as the cells of the retina, are in a higher oxygen demand throughout our lifetime, leaving more potential for oxygen stress. My research is focused on how this oxygen level may be optimized in the processes of retina injury and retina repair. To model retina injury, I use the, model, the embryonic chick as my model organism. An eye of the embryonic chick is shown in the bottom right of my slide and the retina is labeled. If I surgically remove the retina, shown in the middle picture, the retina is permanently lost, as it would be in a human. However, we have found that if we add the antioxidant drug NAC shortly after retina removal, within seven days, a complete new retina is formed. The regenerating retina can be shown, is labeled CR in the picture on the bottom left. Now a lot of work remains to be done for this to become possible, <coughs> such as finding out what are the optimal levels in other conditions, such as in the adult or even the human. But what we have shown here is that we have taken what is normally a permanent injury response, and by manipulating the oxygen levels in the eye, we have turned it into a healing response. I hope that this I hope that this uh, contributes to the furtherment of the, the Audacious School initiative. Thank you. Finalist number 10 is Katie Duffy. She's in the Department of Speech Pathology and Audiology. Her advisor is Professor Susan Brem, and she will be talking about mindfulness and voice quality. All right, hello everyone. Um, so to begin this presentation, I would like everyone to raise your hand if you've ever experienced a hoarse voice or a sore throat. Yeah, that's a lot of people. And have those symptoms ever gotten so bad that they've affected your daily life or even your ability to do your job? Yeah, so it's something that a lot of people deal with. And if these symptoms worsen and persist over time, they can be diagnosed as a voice disorder. So unsurprisingly, the diagnosis of a voice disorder can come with a lot of stress. But it's important to note that there's two different kinds of stress. First, you have the physical stress and strain on the vocal mechanism itself. And second, you have a psychological stress that's chronic and often related to an inability to do your job. And the stress can become so intertwined with voicing that it can actually be detected through acoustic measures in the voice, such as pitch. So part of my job as a speech language pathologist is to help my clients return to their optimal voicing. We have several different traditional treatment methods we use to do this, but what I wanted to explore with my thesis was if mindfulness-based stress reduction or MBSR techniques could be useful in treating those stress components that come along with the voice disorder. MBSR has been shown in the medical literature to reduce pain, tension, and anxiety, so I wanted to see if it would translate over into speech pathology. So we had three participants in my study who were all vocal performance majors here at Miami University and have been diagnosed with a voice disorder. <coughs> so when they came in for their voice therapy session, we took data in three different ways. The first was a survey called the Voice Handicap Index. And the questions on this survey were related to voice quality and how that voice quality impacted their daily lives. The second data measurement we had was another survey with this questions were revolved around overall levels of stress and tension in their everyday life. And the third data measurement we had were acoustic measures. So we recorded our participants both speaking and sustaining vowels, or holding out ah for three to five seconds, to track those acoustic measures such as pitch. So we did initial acoustic recordings of those vocal tasks, and then we practiced body <coughs> scan meditation. We focused on one specific MBSR exercise, which is a form of guided meditation, in which a person sits comfortably in a chair and is directed to different areas of the body to recognize and then hopefully release any tension being held there. So we did the body scan meditation and then additional follow-up audio recordings of those same vocal tasks. So what we found was that over the course of treatment, all of the participants reported improved vocal quality and subsequent <coughs> quality of life. Additionally, all participants reported they had lower levels of overall tension, and two out of three reported they had lower levels of overall stress. In terms of the acoustic measures, all of the participants' speaking fundamental frequency, or the pitch at which they spoke, rose over the course of treatment, which is also indicative to a more healthy voice quality. So based on the results of this study, we 
are concluding that MBSR exercises such as the body scan can be an effective treatment method for those who 